start talking a little bit more about design. Herbert Simon is one of those great classics of design. He's a bit hard going, difficult to read. But one of the things I love about what he says about design is that it's aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. So like I said, it's not rocket science. It's the ability to stand back and to look at the situation and to decide how it might be different. It does tend to drive people mad. It's not, it's not a rocket science thing. It's a thing that you do just by walking around and looking. My kids say to me, do we really have to redesign every doorway properly? Um, when you start looking at escalators, you'll start seeing, I wonder why they've only got three of those and one of those, or why are they making everybody pull at the bottom of the stairs? Again, it's not complex. It's about looking at a situation that's occurring, listening to what's happening around you, and then coming up with a different and a preferred way of working. And it matters a great deal for, for business and for experience. I think it matters because I think the last stats I heard were that 47% of, of successful startup businesses put design and design thinking as a priority on the way that they develop their systems and their, their tools. 47% of British startup businesses, and that was four years ago, 18% of established businesses, and I suspect those stats are really different these days. 38 million people in America are counted as part of the creative classes, so working with knowledge, with information, with management. So it matters because designing complex solutions to complex problems require new ways of thinking and upside-down ways of thinking. It matters because of Walmart's great mistake. I don't know how many of you have heard of them. Um, there was a situation last year with Walmart that they call it their billion-dollar mistake. What Walmart did was they went out and they asked their customers what they'd like to see in a new Walmart. And they said, you know, tell us what you think. And the customers said, you know, it'd be really nice if it wasn't so cluttered. It'd be really nice if there wasn't so much stuff everywhere. If things were better labelled, if, if packets were cleaner, if, if the whole store felt fresher. So they put in place um, an enormous transformation. They took away half the stock lines. They made things cleaner and smarter, and that's what happened to their revenue. And it was almost instant. And part of the reason that happened was because they asked customers what they thought instead of use the skills of design which say to watch, listen, observe and learn. So they can be small things from engaging a creative class in working in new ways or it can be big things as in not having to deal with these sorts of figures. And I think even more importantly design which used to be about funky cool things and it still is and we like to have all the nice toys and the nice looking workplaces and the nice things. But even more it's about just finding a situation that's worth improving. It could be something as simple as helping somebody change their address because the content on the internet was saying one thing and the content on the mobile phone was saying the other. It could be as something as simple as changing an address on a mobile phone because that's what people want to do but we don't currently offer that service. It may be as simple as putting out a brochure that has a particular colour that people like. Seek had a, um, a problem with people joining up. This is about three years ago. People joining up and they, they changed the interface and they added a one pixel by one pixel, for those of you who are not pixel people. It's a tiny square that's less than a millimetre, and it's pink. And by adding that pixel to the sign-up link on the form, they increased the sign-up by 68% in the first three months. All they were doing was looking at a situation worth improving and thinking how we might approach this from different angles. I think there's a lot of, a lot of emphasis about coming up with ideas. We have a, and I, you probably find it in work, that it's the idea, coming up with the idea, coming up with the concept, coming up with that initial brilliant thing. But ideas really, ideas are easy, and you, you know this because you work in a company where innovation is, is, is emphasised, but ideas are easy to find, it's the implementation of those ideas that are not. About five years ago, IDEO, which is a big design firm in the UK and America and everywhere else, um, started to work with Bank of America. They wanted to look at ways to help um, underprivileged families save money. Some of you may know about it, the change for good um, that they did. What they did was they allowed people, they looked at people's savings habits, they went out into people's homes, they looked at how people saved, and they found out that the change jar, despite everything, despite all of the credit cards, despite all of the, all of the different tools that we have for financial management, people still kept a change jar, and they still threw loose change in that, and they still saw that as saving. So they sent away a bunch of designers who said, well, what can we do with this? What does it look like? So they designed a savings program. Hello. <laughs> they designed a savings program that um, allowed people just to round up the money to the nearest dollar. And this changed massive savings habits. They had people who'd never had a bank account in their life before suddenly saving significant amounts of money. They were able to engage in account matching for people who saved successfully who may never have had either a relationship with a bank or a relationship with any kind of savings account. And it was a great idea. But then Melbourne, Bank of Melbourne took 
that hmm. idea. And they said, what about if we could make more money out of this? What if it wasn't about saving for good? What about if it was making cash? So they took that cents account. And now what you can do with their credit card is that you have an option and you can opt in to round up every, cent, every dollar that you spend to the nearest dollar and that money will be transferred into your savings account. Same idea, different context. The idea is not original, but what Bank of Melbourne were able to do with it was they were able to think in a completely different way. And I think we spend so much time fighting after that great, brilliant idea that we forget that organisations have great skills and great tools for iterating ideas, for taking ideas and applying them to context. All of you are here, here because you're, in, you're interested in ideas, you're interested in how ideas come about. It's just as interesting to see what might become of those if they were tried out in a different context, a different colour, a different group of people, a different environment. Maybe it's something that would work in the country. It's just as innovative and just as creative and just as designerly as working with a brand new idea. Which brings us to our tools. I had a real problem with this one because designers love to talk about their methodology. It's part of what makes us feel grown up. We're really, really worried that we draw pictures and you might not take us seriously in the business world. So what we do is we create methodologies that fit with business methodologies. So this one comes from D-School. It's their standard design methodology. It looks nice and pretty in pictures, but it has those, those steps, understand and observe, which is sometimes called empathy or analyse or research in other methodologies. Observe, understand, don't ask what you'd like people to do because you'll always get told things that are within the constraints of what we already know. Ask somebody what they'd like to drink and they'll tell you a drink they know because they can't tell you a drink they don't know because they haven't imagined that yet. So by observing and understanding, by watching and learning, by listening carefully and by watching what people do, we have an opportunity to understand differently, so they're related. And that definition helps us go, well, what is it we're looking at here? How might we design a public transport system that people don't hate? How might we design a pair of shoes that has retractable heels so that I don't have to carry five pairs of shoes with me every day? How might we design escalators that don't dump people at the bottom into a great big huddle so everyone has to do this? all sorts of problems that come out from defining the question but in businesses we spend a lot of time coming up with great answers and then looking for questions to apply to them what the design process does is stop you forming those answers until you've been to the questions then the prototype bit and this is the bit that i'm hearing a lot of talk about prototyping recently all prototyping does is learning by doing there's a gap between what we know and what we do and you've all been there that bit where you go oh, this is going to be a fantastic presentation it's going to be a fantastic pack it's going to be a fantastic concept as you start to actually write it, build it, do it, make it, it sort of evolves a bit and you need to add a bit more salt or a bit less that or suddenly the single great idea that was going to be fantastic now has 47 different bullet points and you have to make it simple. That's what prototyping does. It says, you know what, it's going to look worse in real life than it is on the page. I have a, an eight-year-old daughter and she spent most of the last three days making stuff out of cardboard boxes. She's made um, a set of slippers, which she was greatly trying to sell on the, the front doorstep yesterday at a cost of $5 per pair in the rain. Um, we have, we've been doing gluing, painting and cutting, and every now and again she'll go, well, that didn't work, and throw it over her shoulder. And yet we don't do that. Design is about, hmm, interesting, not so good, let's throw it away. And if it's made of cardboard or it's made of a quick bit of image made into a graphic, and it doesn't really matter. So design methodology isn't strangely innovative, it's not strangely new, it's not anything that you didn't know before. And there's about 17 different ones of these, most of them will start with exactly those stages called analyse, research, design, prototype and evaluate. And the really important bit at the end is test, because it's not until you put something in front of people that they're going to tell you why they don't love it. We had, um, I was at a, a conference a few months ago and somebody showed me a mobile phone and they said, have a look at this, tell me what you see. And I said, oh, yep, I can see money in a box. And I said, do you see the big pink number at the bottom? And I was like, oh, oh yeah, now you mention it. Yes, I can see the big pink number at the bottom. It's great, isn't it? I said, mm, yeah, now that you've drawn my attention to it. Well, at that size in pink, it's definitely going to be noticed by everyone, isn't it? So I said, well, why don't we ask people at the table? Not a single person at the table picked up the pink big number. So all you've done is you've created a prototype, you've tested it, and you found out it doesn't work and the number probably needs to be maybe on the left or the right or not pink or in the middle. Or perhaps the number isn't the thing that's important after all. It's not till you put it in front of people that you can fall out of love with that idea and start to realise what it's really like. So those are just other things that you'll find if you look into design methodology. The reason I get funny about it is because 
People present design methodology as if it's something that only designers can do. But you'll see, they're completely accessible. They're completely reasonable things. They're about learning to think in certain ways and learning to listen to certain things, not to be completely new. The really important thing is what motivates people. And I think the more I think about design thinking, a lot of it's focusing on the tools that we use, not about empathy and intuition and imagination and idealism. And those are complicated things. There's a credit card that was um, developed out of Singapore um, called Frank, which is all about having a credit card that you desire. They're managing to sell, for those of you that know Frank, it can cost up to $1,000 for a designer um, graphic on your credit card. Sounds a bit like a bank thing to do. On the other hand, there are artists being commissioned to produce artworks for credit cards that would not have had commissions for artworks in other ways. So is it wrong? And I think understanding what people do and what people like and what people covet is as important as it, as it is understanding what it is that they might do. It might be that finding out, you might go off into a great big research project and you might be trying to find out how it is that people understand money. What you might find out is actually that they can't read the brochures because the diagrams are too complicated. That's the beauty of what's, and that's the addiction of working in design, is that often the solutions that you find are on the reverse side of where you started to look. So it's like being a, a, a treasure hunter. Who would have come up with that as a workplace? I think it's great. I'd love one. But it certainly wasn't what would come up if you designed a brief, set in place a project and said you were going to design a workplace. It was a little bit of fun, a little bit of creativity, a little bit of listening, and a lot of imagination. It's um, MTV's headquarters in Berlin. So you come around in this full loop. It seems to me that design thinking is always about asking questions and interesting questions. A lot of times in the, the work that I do in my day job, I get approached by people who say, well, we've got this project, we want you to test it and tell us if it works. If somebody can come to me a little bit earlier and say, I've got this idea and we think it might be useful, we'd like to try it out with you and see if it works, that's a cheaper an easier and a more sustainable question. It's much, much easier. For example, we launched um, some mobile phone technology recently um, that had a few different services in it. She says, thinking carefully not to say the thing she's not allowed to say. <laughs> <laughs> I like telling stories. But in this mobile phone app, there was just a very simple change to the login process, which made something simpler that was not simple before. So it became a four-digit pin, not a six-digit pin. It's not rocket science, but it was a solution to a problem. And the question was, why do pe more people not log in? And we went out and watched what people did on trams. If you try putting a six-digit password with lowercase and uppercase in on a tram, just as the number 48 goes around the corner to Spring Street, it's not possible. So you can't do these things without looking at what people do, and you can't do it without framing questions. And those questions might be simple. Why does everyone leave their coffee cups in the branch? Or it might be really, really complex. Why is it that despite everything we do for people, they're really not interested in money? So, I was asked back here in, in October to do some workshops, some prototyping with you around workplaces, and it got me thinking about workplaces and how a designer would approach a workplace. And I got thinking about a whole range of different things. What if work wasn't a place? How many of you work from home sometimes? Yeah. And when you work from home, do you work in an office? Do you work on the kitchen table? Where do you work? Where did you say you worked at home? At a desk. Any other advances on desks for working from home? It's a desk, but it's at home. Some people work on trams, some people work in parks. What if summer and winter made a difference? What if on the hot, sweaty days, instead of having to get onto the tram and come to work, you could sit in your back garden? What if in winter, when it was freezing cold, you could work in your rug boots? What if you could wear your rug boots on the tram to work without anyone looking at you? What if it was a place you went sometimes? What if instead of going there every day, you went there sometimes? What would that look like? I worked in a virtual team um, in the northwest of Western Australia for three years where I, went, I caught up with my team face-to-face -face once every three months and the rest of the time we worked on MSN. So we told a lot of jokes and we exchanged a lot of photographs and we did a lot of talking. But it was a different place because I went there sometimes. When I went down to Perth to catch up with my team, we did as much socialising as we did working. But that's made up for the fact that we worked twice as hard because we were not face-to-face -face and distracting each other the rest of the time. How many workplaces do you have? Are your workplaces defined by where your computer is or where your phone is? So what might it look like? I can imagine that in your heads at this moment you've got all sorts of different pictures. Some of you will be thinking about your desk. Some of you will be thinking about the beach. Some of you will be thinking about going to work. Every single one of you will have in your head at this point a different image of what you think a workplace should be like. And this is the beginning of the magic of design thinking. 
is that our job is to take all of those different concepts and all of those different understandings and all of those different stories about what work are and look for patterns in them, and things that we might replicate. So we want to form a stronger emotional bonds. What do you have on your desk? I'm currently in the middle of doing some design work with um, our workplace transformation people and I'm one of the people who hate flexi desking. I'm a shoe problem. I'm classified as a shoe problem. I have about six or seven pairs of shoes under my desk, several in a bag in the cupboard that I sit with. And I have piles of books and papers and textures and favourite pens and little things that are funny and make, remind me of things. I'm one of those people. You know, you know the sort. And I sit next to somebody who's one of the sort that has an immaculate desk and will actually every now and again pick up my stuff and just sort of tidal wave it back across the desk. I had a lovely story, a guy who was a Nobel Prize winner and he was apparently, I, I feel better every time I hear this story. He had a problem with his desk, he never ever tidied anything up. So he built another layer, a brick layer on top of it, some bricks and planks, so he had a double story desk, so that when the bottom layer got full he could start to build up the top layer. And the layer started to break one day and everything fell into everything else and made this giant soup of stuff. And out of that came his Nobel Prize, because as he was tidying up those pictures and as he was putting those things together, he looked at two ideas that he would never have associated with each other. And out of that came a brand new concept. I think it's Stephen Johnson who writes about innovation, who talks about adjacent possibility. What happens when one idea collides with another idea? What happens when you get capability that clashes together? A lot of that happens in design. And it happens because there's no point me sitting with the product manager and doing design work. I need to sit with the product manager. I need to sit with the risk expert. I need to sit with the tech guy who knows how all the plugs work. I need to sit with the data person. I need to understand what they're looking for. I need to go out and watch customers and listen to what they do. And it's no good and it won't work unless I do all that listening and I do all that synthesis. Because it's that that gives me the ideas to prototype. And there's a lot of really bad press that design gets. Oh, you guys just live in the blue sky space. All you do is think about things that are impossible and impractical. But it's also not true because design thinking is as much about constraint as it is about possibility. And that whole looking and understanding is understanding what's not possible as well as what is possible. You're never going to get a, a, a big financial institution to completely change all of its back-end systems overnight just because you want to do something better for customers. It's just not going to happen. You know that? I know that. There's no point in me saying, you know, I'd really like to deck out the design lab with Mac because we'd work much better. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice try. Not going to work. But within that space that says there's a constraint, there's also a great opportunity. It's that knowing, doing space again. It's saying, I can't replace all the technology, but what if I was to give everybody a map that allowed them to see exactly where they fit in the process? What about instead of giving people brochures full of text to explain something, I gave them pictures on a map so that they were able to explain it in their own words, in their own language, and in their own style with prompts from this map? What about instead of making a brochure for somebody, I need to give them something they can write on? Because I've been out and I've watched everybody working with customers and clients and I've seen that every single person who works with a customer scribbles something down on a piece of paper, tears it off and gives it to a client. With the nice brochure, with the email link, with all the stuff we sent them, there's always a post-it note with a bit of paper or something scribbled on the back of the pack that was printed out from the printer. That's design thinking. And that's saying, I watched what you did. Yes, the big stuff's underway, but there's something that you do every day that I could make simpler and better just by looking at it from a different angle. And the constraints are the bit that makes it fun. We actually don't like it. Invent something new from scratch. It sends any bunch of designers into an absolute frenzy. What do you mean from scratch? I can do that. It's the very bits that actually put roadblocks in the way that make us think creatively. It's the bit which we say, OK, that's a risk problem. We can't solve it. But what does that risk person know? I actually don't know very much about anything. And I do an awful lot of listening to people talk about things that they know an awful lot about. And that's the job of design is to get people to tell you what they know to, and to reflect it back to them in ways that they can make assumptions. We had a, a project recently, one of those ones that... I think I've got a few extra gray hairs on it. One of those ones that had about 10 different groups of stakeholders, some internal, some external, some consultants, some groups of consultants. And all of these people came together and they were all designing brilliant solutions alone. So. The one team was defining what it was that people wanted, another team was defining the data that would be needed, another team was defining what the interface would look like. You know how it goes. Everyone gets really, really busy and it gets close to deadline and you start talking about whether or not you get this approved. I know what we'll do. We'll print off the 800-line spreadsheet, we'll send it around to people and we'll get them to approve it by Monday. Deal? Deal. 
it'll all be well. So you send off your 800 line spreadsheet into the ether and nothing happens. Monday morning comes, nobody's replied to my spreadsheet, nobody's reading my spreadsheet. So how might we look at this differently? First of all, why is no one reading it? No one's reading it because it's complicated and it's boring. And it has lots and lots of coloured boxes on it. And what happens if I press a box that, that I don't know what it is? And what happens if I accidentally delete something? Imagine all that work gone in five and a half seconds. So we thought, what if we put every single person in the room together? What if we brought the BAs and the data architects and the tech people and the consultants and the stakeholders and we locked everyone up in one room for two weeks? And we said, what we're going to do is we're going to give you a designer. That designer is going to draw what it is that we're trying to make here. And you're going to say whether or not that drawing reflects um, what's actually happening in this room. Said, yeah, why would you bother with that? It's so easy. So we sat down in the room together and we had one of our team do wireframes. Those of you, wireframes are just sketches of what a web page would look like in practice. It has no colour, it has nothing about it, it's just a picture. And we said, okay, the first, first got to the first requirement. The first requirement said user needs login. So we drew a password screen and a login button on the screen. To next. Oh, no, 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 someone's going to need three logins. Most, most of them will need three logins. Oh, you can't have three logins. The system doesn't do three logins. Well, we have to have three logins. Well, I'm sorry, but, you know, we'll have to make do. What about two and a half logins? No, no, no. Got to be three logins. Well, we haven't got the data for that. We can't do three logins. So this amazing, heated, fairly heated argument came into being. And in the end, those people went off and they had a workshop themselves and they solved the problem. But if we hadn't visualised it for them and if we hadn't drawn them a picture and if we hadn't said, this is what you say you want, then we wouldn't have had that argument and we wouldn't have solved that problem. So design doesn't solve problems itself, but it does show people the impact of some of the choices that you're making in ways that sometimes we didn't see. I know you've had BJ Fogg out here to talk about behaviour change and amplify, but a lot of the things that we're asking people to do in the workplace um, require people to do things differently. This thinking differently, thinking about things from a question point of view, thinking about things from a people side of perspective is different. And that requires change. And BJ Fogg has a program he calls Three Tiny Habits, which was about selecting a small thing over a period of a week. Three small things. Each one had to take no more than 30 seconds, and each one had to be tied to a habit that you did every single day. So for me, I did, um, when I got up in the morning, I would stretch both arms. A very big commitment for me. Um, after I had my lunch, I would go and stand outside on the balcony and get fresh air because I'm notorious for not quite making it outside of the building at any point during the day. And the other one was after I'd answered my first email in the morning, I would do one personal thing off my to-do list because my personal to-do list always gets left until the last minute. And it was great. So I took it to work and we started to use it in work. And one of the comments that um, one of my colleagues made was, I don't have fixed habits at work anymore. There's nothing I do every day at the same time every day anymore. I don't have coffee at the same time. I don't tidy my desk at the same time. I don't even come in at the same time each day anymore. I meet different people each day. My projects require me to be in different places and working with different teams. There is no static habit in my workplace. So then we start thinking, well, how could design help with that? It becomes much easier once you see the problem. It's not that people don't want to change. It's that how do you anchor this change down and how do you, you get this difference? And I think design's all about paradox. It's about coming up with those strange things. It's why do people not make changes despite wanting to make changes? Why do people not change their address despite the fact that we have a change of address link on every single channel that we operate in? Why do people not lose weight just like that by going on diets? Why, do, why does Melbourne have the most successful behaviour change programme with its water use known to mankind internationally and then throw it away? There's all sorts of paradoxes that come up in design. This little thing here I love, it's, uh, it's in France. They've just started making these, um, they're in parks and they're, they're rechargeable um, workstations. So there are plug sockets to recharge your phone. They are solar powered and they have wi they're Wi-Fi hotspots. Each of these concrete chairs has a fold-out desk and you can fool around with it. And they've even thought about the apartment people who live upstairs because they put the green roof in so it looked nicer when you look down on bus stops from above. So it's just a great example of what would it be. Five years ago, nobody needed to work in a park, but that would have come directly out of how might we help people work in parks better, because they already do. So again, it's not very difficult. It's about finding that question. What is that question? And in there is that opportunity. I like this one at the top because it looks so unlike an office. I just had to put it in. Sorry. So we talked before about visualising requirements, and I think design thinking is really about 
creating vivid pictures of the future. A lot of focus gets put on artifacts, but a lot of it's about drawing pictures. Drawing pictures of that system help people have arguments and conversations they wouldn't have had. Drawing sketches of what a credit card might look like helps people discuss whether or not it actually is right. I used to be a, a web designer, for those of you who are in the room who do web design. We have a, a lovely story about the, the co-creative web page, which starts off as a beautiful piece of design and, and gradually descends into a state of pink flashing trailing curses and kittens and, and headings that change colour depending as you go down the page. But at least if you drew it first, you'd have a picture of that future and you'd say, we don't want to go there. It's really, really easy because it, just in the same way, I'd say, how many, how many different ways are there for you to eat your dinner? There were four clear ways just in the first question I asked today. There's always going to be a multiple different way that you can look at and that you can view that future. But by using some of those tools of design, listening, sketching, making mock-ups, you actually get to test those out and decide whether or not that great idea actually looks like that in real life. Design's also got a bad name for producing beautiful artefacts. I'm not allowed to use the word artefact at work, even though I like it. Um, because artefacts is all about finished products. Designers got really good at producing great journey maps. I'm sure that you've all got beautiful journey maps or some kinds of sketches or something that was produced at vast expense by a design agency somewhere on the wall, somewhere in your department. And design artefacts are really great. They're really, really useful, but they're only useful in telling a story. They're only useful in, now that we've got this on paper, what kind of conversation do we need to have? We've been looking at things like journey maps and understanding how journey maps are used. And journey maps are really basically looking at what a customer does and how they actually move through an experience in life. As they move through that experience, they interact with our business on different levels and we need to understand how that happens. But journey maps often were produced as great ways of putting things on the wall. What they're really valuable for is, look at this really horrible, messy spaghetti bit here. We've got $2 million allocated to this project. Is this project going to fix this messy spaghetti bit here? Well, actually, no, it's going to come nowhere near it. So maybe we want to change that. Or maybe we want to apply that $2 million somewhere differently so that we can deal with that spaghetti bit. The purpose of that design artifact isn't to change anything. It's to have the conversation with the right people so that you can make sensible decisions, and sometimes creative decisions. So... I've been talking to you a little bit about workplaces. I know you had paper at the beginning, so you can probably find it again. What I want you to do is just get hold of a piece of paper again and think about things like, I want to put you back into that space of summer, winter, trying things out, looking at things differently, going up escalators, think about things that make you laugh about work, think about things that make you um, cry. Think about my personal thing at the moment, they took away my bin. I'm very offended that they took away my bin. I don't like it. I need a bin. <laughs> we don't have bins because um, the, the flies come. So we, we now have no bins. Um, so I want you to think about this workplace and I want you to just take two minutes. No, it's not two minutes, it's too long. 30 seconds. Just to think about a workplace and I want you just to write two words that describe that workplace. Don't censor it. Two words that come into your head when you think of workplaces and just jot them down on the piece of paper that you've got. It can be any two words. Don't think too hard. Don't censor it. Just write it down. And then I want you to think about your favourite, absolute favourite comfy chair. The best place to sit. The place you go when you've got your track pants on at home, when you really aren't caring too much about life, the universe and everything. And I want you to write down two words that you associate with that really comfortable chair and write them on the piece of paper next to your workplace words. So you've got two words that describe your workplace and you've got two words that describe that amazing comfy chair. Okay, can I grab a couple of words about workspaces to shout them to me? Any words people have about workspaces? Collaborative? You're lucky. Comfortable? You're lucky too. Freedom? <laughs> Sorry? Creative? What about, sorry? <laughs> yeah, I want to come see what chairs you've got. <laughs> I need to have a look. Um, what about the words with chairs? Give me some words about your favourite sitting chair. Relax. Cozy. Smoothy. Warm. <laughs> sorry? 
Anything else? Mine's got chocolate wrappers down the back. Um, so I think you think about those words, that would be a set of design constraints that we could start with. It doesn't involve thinking, thinking of design constraints doesn't involve thinking really in any huge complex ways about things. But if you try to make, if you said, what if my workspace was like my chair? What if my workspace was like my holidays? It starts to allow you to think outside of that constraint and starts to let you input a whole range of different things that you wouldn't have otherwise thought of in relation to workplaces. And that's what we do in the workplace. You might say, credit, what if a credit card was a glow-in-the-dark credit card that went red when you left it on the table and it was overdrawn? What if? And some of those things are great fun and great, greatly exciting, so long as you have the tools and the methodologies that allow you to go back and sort those out. I love this quote because it's about beauty, and I think that prototypes are not beautiful. Prototypes are ugly. They're glued together out of cardboard boxes. We've made ATMs out of cardboard boxes. We've made chairs. We've made stools. We've made train stations. We've made post boxes. We've made credit cards. We've made all sorts of things, and they're never beautiful. But most of the time, provided we've been able to work with a team and we've been able to work broadly and we've been able to take all of those different threads of information and we've been able to listen and watch and observe, then the solution starts to be beautiful. And what's really exciting is when a team that you've been working with like that goes away and says, I would never have had that conversation with that group if it hadn't been for that workshop. Or I would never have asked somebody about this particular question if I hadn't seen that they were involved in a workshop with me. Or I've been having coffee with that person every day for five years and I never knew that we had so much in common. I think that's the power of design. It's not a set of funky tools. It's a set of really basic methodologies. It's not a set even of things that you have to learn step by step. It's about understanding, listening, and having the humility to stand back and think you might be wrong. And it's certainly the idea to try things out and laugh at yourself when it goes horribly wrong. We once designed an online learning course. It was hugely expensive. And it had this augmented reality sort of entry point. Um, it was, and it was supposed to be like a prison. It was some security training. And we were, we just, oh, it was so cool, this thing. We thought, you know, 17-year-old young guys, they're going to so love this. It looks like World of Warcraft. It's so great. And we took it into a testing lab, and everyone just sat there and looked at it. And after about five minutes, so, and they said, how do you turn it on me? And it was a brilliant design, and it was beautiful, but we couldn't turn it on. No, not, not a single person in that whole room could find out how to get into this beautiful system. And it's a really fundamental mistake. There was another, I've heard another great innovation story about a company that wanted to design a gadget. And they designed this gadget, something that you'd have in your handbag all the time, think hairbrush, so that it had electronics in it. And that handbrush with electronics in it actually then needed charging. And so then you had a hairbrush that needed charging before it would work, or something else. So it's great to fall in love with great ideas, but using a design methodology helps you go, what am I seeing? What might the creative solution look like? Is it an idiotic idea? And if it is an idiotic idea, then where else might it go? Because lots of ideas are idiotic to start with. SMS was idiotic to start with. Still is really so some of you will choose to do a little bit more of this. Some of you will choose to say, you know, I might play this, I might see how it works. What we've devised for you is a little bit of a, a, a project that you can be involved in over the next few months. We're going to take you through the design process around your workplaces. Today we've used workplaces as a bit of an example. But what we're going to do is use Yammer, um, and I'm told there's a group already set up. We've got. Um, what we'd like to do is to actually get you involved in some observations and some listening. I'm going to ask you to do a small commitment. It might be to watch some people on a tram. It might be to take a photograph. It might be to observe your own desk. Or it might be to do to bring something into somebody else's desk. What you're going to be taken through is a process where you'll have no solutions as yet, but a series of questions that you'll start to build about the work and the way that you work and the workplace that you work in. And what we want to do is to use this observation and this research in the same way that we would do in a design methodology. We want to use this to look at where there are some patterns about what you're telling us about the workplace. Where are there some patterns in the way that you work? Where are there things that you're not looking at because they seem so obvious? Sometimes it's not till you stop and you look and you go, you know what? I actually spend six hours a week working in a coffee shop. I never knew that. So what would that mean for a company that was trying to support that? If you want to come along with it, just come in. Um, we've got the group that Yama set up. And there'll be little tasks set up there. Might be, and none of it will take you more than two or three minutes. We've done this before with a whole range of things from public transport. And what I find is that sometimes the, the process of just looking and listening and understanding things in a different way is enough to make you feel completely creative about a problem. This is the group. I'm going to have to post all the tasks through Sarah, so we'll get to it. I, I, by Monday, there'll be some stuff up there for you to have a look at. 
what we'll be doing, to, uh, I'll be asking you to do to start with is actually look at your own desk. And if you're happy enough, is to take a photograph of it and upload it. Um, what you'll be surprised at is the number of varieties of different desks that you find. And you'll start to be able to identify people. If you want to remove identifying things, just stick a black blob over them. I'm sure somebody who's good at creative stuff will help you. And you don't have to be creative to do this, but you do have to be somebody who's good at listening and watching and is interested in by what you see. And it'll help you with your own team. It'll help you with the teams you want to work with. And it'll help you with the teams that you work with that are not part of this organisation. A lot of the work that we do increasingly is through other organisations or external people. It's meeting in coffee shops. It's working with groups that we might have networks or connections with that maybe are not directly related to our job. It's still work. How do we bring that into place? How do we spot all the places we're working and use that to build a design? So that's all you need to be, open-minded and collaborative. And it sounds from what people have said today. You need to know what it's like to have a workplace. I guess everyone does. And the other thing is about being prepared to share what you know, because it's not about great ideas. It's about being able to bounce those things off each other. And it's about what happens when those great ideas encounter each other and turn into better ideas. And the other thing is, be prepared to have fun. I saw this great photo the other week about um, a workplace in the US where they'd allowed people to customise their cubicles. And one of the things that these people have done is um, set those up with army tents because they said they were sick of people coming and not knocking when they came into their cubicle. So they set it all up with a tent and a door and a way that people could come in and out of this thing. So let people be creative and they'll come up with solutions to help them work better. It might not be a tent. It might be. And the most important thing is come with a beginner's mind because design, people are, are so in love with design and people are so in love with the concepts of what design can do and design being a great mystery that they sometimes come and pretend that, that it's okay not to know anything at all about design. Design isn't magic. It's just a set of tools that we work through to think differently. This is a workshop that we did with um, the guys from Deloitte around some games and, and, and gamification. Um, and again, one of the tools that you can use to help people think. So I've come and told you all about what makes me really excited. And I've told you about the fact that it's really easy and anyone can do it. And I've offered you an invitation that says, if you'd like to come and have a go and see how it works for you, come and take part in this process. And I'd like to say that once you start, it's amazingly addictive. We usually find that once we start working with stakeholders, they say, well, we'll do a small project with you first. And then we tend to get comments like, well, we've just finished this for you. We're going to present you with the last information. And they say, when can we do the next bit? Because it's fascinating seeing what happens when people use your stuff. It's fascinating knowing what people do. And it's amazing the insights that you get into people's behaviour, what people need and how you tailor things to them. And that's just, yeah, it's, it's addictive. It's fun. So that's what I've got to say to you today. And I'm sure if you have any questions, I can try and answer.